give her up. She is the founder of Black Film Allegiance. And we'll talk a bit about that. I'm not even going to cue that up. But she's the founder of Black Film Allegiance. But she's also the development manager for Monkey Paw Productions, which is Jordan Peele's production company. So, but the reason that she's moderating this is because she's an industry insider, but she's also a black woman rising. Yep, yep. So this is an opportunity for her to like politic with her peers, but also offer insights based on her experience. And this is going to be like some for real black girl magic. So if you guys are on the outside, y'all might want to move to the inside because we about to be family right now. Okay. So without further ado, let me hit up my girl, Elon Washington. Woo! Come to the stage. Thank you, Desiree. Thank you so much for having such me. Such a pleasure, such a pleasure. So you were with us yesterday with Getting to the Green Light. I was. Dropping gems for the filmmakers, letting them know how to put it together, how to present their packages. So today, you're going to be talking to people who they have their stuff ready, they're inspired, they're putting content out. A lot of them have really great followings. So now we're going to get into A, their content, and then B, we're going to get into who they are and what they want to do. Looking first, forward to it. Let's talk about you. <laughs> so let's first, the, the, the really cool thing about Elon is that she was passionate already about how to help other people navigate because she had her own experience navigating. I'm telling her story. <laughs> but um, navigating in the industry and breaking into Hollywood. And so she was passionate about that. So she started Black Femme Allegiance. But apparently through all of those connections, she ended up at Monkey Paw, but Black Femme Allegiance is her baby. So let's talk a bit about Black Femme Allegiance. Yes, yeah, so um, just like you said, Black Film Allegiance was something that I started because I'd recently relocated to Los Angeles and I found it kind of difficult to navigate best ways to make new film friends in that space, but I definitely wanted to meet other like-minded filmmakers, specifically filmmakers of color, and so I did, I founded Black Film Allegiance and that is how I met my first industry connections. And it's, it, the following ranges from like newer filmmakers all the way to industry professionals. So it's been really exciting to see it grow in such a short period of time. And basically the page is something that started on Instagram, but it was something that I wanted to use to promote new and upcoming filmmakers and highlight their different genre focuses and passions and personal goals goals so that other people could could have an opportunity to work with them, reach out to them, and kind of see some of their material as well. So we also have a website, bfallegiance.com, and you can look on there and see some of the content and also follow us at the same BF Allegiance at all of our social media platforms. Okay, so I'm a filmmaker. What, and I, there's all of these things that I got to figure out, right? I'm not a filmmaker yet. Y'all inspiring me. Um, but uh, there's all these things that I got to figure out. I don't, I don't know where to start. What do I reach out to Black Film Allegiance for? Number one, I love when people reach out when they're newly relocating to LA. Or if they're thinking about it and they're not sure and they're in another part of the country and they're trying to decide if the move is the right thing for them. And so it gives them an opportunity to kind of see other people's experiences or reach out to people that are already in Los Angeles and kind of make a network there in advance. So that's one great reason. Another, another is specifically if you are local to have the opportunity to promote some content you're already working on. I like to share people's reels or whatever new clip for any project they're, that they're working on. But also um, film festivals, of course, just like mm -hmm. this one. Because um, we, we love Capital City Black Film Festival and all film fe festivals that focus on filmmakers of, of color. And so we like to feature that as well. And specifically, if it's someone who has a project screening at a festival, please always share that with us too, because we want to promote you to make sure that other people come and support you as well. So those are like the, the top main ones. But also, you can just follow and support if you want to see um, other opportunities for submissions or panels, because we, we feature that too. So if you want to submit to a fellowship opportunity or diversity program, we'll feature all of that. That's awesome. So you're basically the plug. Like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like a better word, you might want to rebrand. I don't know. <laughs> but um, but no, absolutely. I think that's phenomenal. And the, the whole premise of why we do this is to like plug African-American filmmakers into the resources that they need, because we understand that a lot of us are starting from scratch. We don't have the money. We don't have the foundation. And we are like legit telling our family like, no, but for real, like this really could be lucrative in like 15, no, like 12 <laughs> years. But like y'all got to rock with me. And so because of that, 
we need to a lifeline to tap into, especially when we've gotten so far. Exactly. And we feel like it's exactly. time to make that transition. So it's transition, so important. So. It's really important to have that sense of community because I think that we relate to each other in a very specific way when it comes to that or dealing with parents back home and explaining what that is or determining what your plan should be because it looks different for a lot of different people depending on what your area of focus is. So finding finding mentors in those different aspects are really important too. No, absolutely. And so like tell me, so you got Black Film Allegiance is popping, you know, everybody is hitting you up. How do you end up at Monkey Paw? So it kind of was two separate things that, that happened at the same time. While I was building Black Film Allegiance, I had an internship opportunity at Monkey Paw. And so I was building that at the same time and kind of having an opportunity to meet execs at different spaces. And then I would be there interning, doing coverage, and they would be like, wait, how do you know that person? And it would be through the page. So it was just so kind of something that happened at the same time. And through a, another internship at the Mission Entertainment, another great company in Los Angeles, they actually had a connection um, with a development coordinator at the time at Monkey Paw. And I met with her, and then I interned there, then became the development coordinator myself, and then now development manager. Uh, okay, yeah. So, so okay. So I won't, I'm not going to take, like, the whole thing to talk about you, but I do want to ask you, so what, what would you, ideally, if you could be doing anything, like if somebody came and, you know, knocked on your door and was like, hey, I got the best opportunity, I'm answering your prayers, what is it? exactly what I'm doing now, but also with the next steps, which you already know I'm extremely passionate about, mm -hmm. the mentorship aspect. So it's something that I really wish I had, and every time I take a meeting with someone, they say the same exact thing. The, the access to these spaces and having that information is what's most important. So we're working on starting a mentorship program, um, and if you go to bfallegiance.com, you can subscribe to it, and we'll send you out more information as it develops, but we're working on collaborating with different people to kind of see the best way that that should be um, facilitated, but I want to model it Similarly to like Big Brothers Big Sisters, but for adults mm -hmm. and for people pursuing the, the film industry. And I think that that would be really helpful, especially for filmmakers of color, because a lot of people not only don't have access, but don't know anyone in that space. And it's just really helpful to see someone show you that it's possible. That's awesome. So who was the person who showed you that it was possible? You weren't ready for that, I've, huh? Yeah, I wasn't. <laughs> but but, I, but I've, been, I've been blessed to have a series of great people that kind of okay. showed me that over time. It started with excellent teachers. Mm -hmm. um, even even in my undergrad, Amy Angiri was an excellent um, professor in school. Um, Tara Jackson in my graduate program. It's been a series of excellent professors. But also kind of just, I came in kind of at the right time, which everyone now has that opportunity too. These last five years have been an incredible time for filmmakers of color. And so to kind of see like Jordan Peele and, and different filmmakers of color, Color Ryan Coogler, Issa Rae, see their journey that's been happening. It's just, mm -hmm. it's ins inspiring. And it shows you that not only is it possible, but it's a continuous change that's not just going to be a phase or a fad like a lot of people thought it would be. We're right. not going to let that happen. That's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. So I already know, like in five years, Black Film Allegiance is going to be like the big thing. Thank and you, Desiree. I, I, you know, I really hope that it grows and that you are able to tap into other people who will feed into Black Film Allegiance so your resources will be bountiful. So that's awesome. Thank I'm you. going to exit, but I want to, if you don't mind, welcome up the ladies that we are talking to today. And I guess I could call you guys out. We're missing one. She's going to like slide in like the five heartbeats. Um, so first we're going to welcome Dallas native Sakita Lewis up to the stage. The project that she's going to be presenting today is 100. Then we have Manira Jones. And the project that she's going to be presenting today is... Dang, it has the word F-boy in it, and it's like F-boy magic, or F-boys better get out my DMs, or F-boys all in my text messages, and yeah, so she's gonna, she's gonna talk about that. We also have Tasha Eden Bird, and she, is a, she has an upcoming documentary called Take Back the Crown. Join us, Tasha. And you know, we gotta big up Austin, right? We gotta have an Austin person up in here representing. So we have Tia Williams, and she has a series right now that's coming out called Gentrified, and it's about the gentrification in Austin, but from a whole different perspective. So welcome. And y'all are gonna shift over as I get up and leave that one over there open, and I'm going to go. Take it from here. Thank you, Desiree. Let everyone get situated. 
I'm so excited to be up here with you ladies. Um, I'd love to start off and hear more about you guys and what your journey experience has been. Do you want to go from this way forward and kind of talk about your experience with filmmaking, if you chose film or film chose you? Love to hear your story. Um, hi everybody, Sakita Lewis. I'm originally from Chicago, Dallas native now, and I think my journey to film has been very interesting. It's been circuitous. My background is in electrical engineering <laughs> and in marketing. And I think that the bug bit me and um, chose me to kind of to keep going with it. My um, first feature is, is called Jericho. And that film um, was here at the Capital City Black Film Festival in 2016. Won best, best feature. And so um, since then, I, my husband is my filmmaking partner. And so we've just been continually working on what's the next thing that's important to us. And that's what we're going to share with you guys today. Hi, my name is Madeira Sakia Jones. And I am a writer and creator of Juntland. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Juntland is a, a series, a largely satirical series of, of animated and live action uh, shorts that are centered around women, specifically black women. And I think the arts chose me from a young age. Um, I grew up in the theater. My mother is an actress, still is an actress, award winning stage actress. And so I grew up under. Um, that whole will and suspension of disbelief. But I think um, I gravitated towards film in the end, even though I love everything about uh, stage plays and the productions. But I don't know, I, I got bitten by the film book, so that's where I landed. Hello, everybody. My name is Tasha N. Bird. And I guess, well, I'm a new filmmaker, so I guess film chose me. So my piece is um, a natural health documentary, and it talks about the brands and influencers, stylists, and clients about how they have all worked together to catapult the natural health movement in space. As you can see, we are represented well, whether it be on commercial, TV, um, there is nowhere you can go and not see a naturalista. So I'm so excited to be sharing this piece with you. This is my baby. Um, I'm totally sleep deprived right now <laughs> from just trying to kind of wrap it up and get the project done. So I'm so excited for everyone to see it. But yeah, I love it. <laughs> All right, so I wasn't sure if this was on, was on, but yeah. So I'm Tia Williams, um, and I was actually born here in Austin, raised in Houston, and then bounced back here and kind of followed in my mom's footsteps. I'll say that film actually chose me. Um, I've always been a bit of a creative and I kind of struggled with figuring out how I could add to social justice through my gifts. And I started out kind of writing short stories. And someone I was with at the time told me, you know what? These are very descriptive. You should take a look into film. And I took a class at the Austin Film School here. And South by Southwest came around. I was a part of that. And then since then, I was like, you know what? This is what I want to do. I'm going to do it. And I don't care about anything else. Um, so Gentrified is a web series about gentrification. Not just an issue here that's impacting Austin, but everywhere, Brooklyn, DC, Atlanta, LA, Oakland, um, a lot of places where we're kind of being displaced. So I wanted to create something that kind of took the politics out of it, but spoke more to the emotional impact um, that's kind of happening to us. So yeah, I'm super excited about the project, and like you, I'm sleep deprived. Um, <laughs> we were talking earlier about running, but yeah, I'm excited it's almost here. So. Thank you guys. And Jabri Weber will also be joining us momentarily, but we'll have her introduce herself when we're screening her project. So we also have content from each of these ladies that we'll be screening as well. And let's start with Sakita. So 100 is the project that we're working on right now. And it talks about obesity and diabetes. Um, it features a man who's recently diagnosed with diabetes and it, it really features what his journey and struggle is and how he's gonna go about overcoming that. What you're gonna see is a teaser, a concept trailer of the film that really focuses in on the darkness that goes along with this disease often and um, will really focus and showcase how he can turn things around in his life.
I made dinner for us. What happened to you? Excellent work, excellent work. Um, and we have Mr. Brandon Lewis with us, actually the star of the, of the film, um, so shout out to him. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, what, what I appreciated the most on top of the extremely gripping and important content was that you integrated comedy into there also. You wanna talk about that decision? Sure, I mean, this is a passion project for Brandon and I. Uh, he was diagnosed with type two diabetes in 2015, and as we were, you know, really grappling with what does that mean, what lifestyle changes do we have to make, uh, we decided to pour that into a script because we knew that we weren't the only ones uh, dealing with that in our family. And so Brand is a comedian, and as we were working through that script, you know, it's really something that we, when we talk about being overweight and obesity, um, it's something that we, we laugh about, right? Like if, if you go to any comedy show, it's, there's, there's a tons of great funny jokes that are part of it, and it's funny until it's not funny, right? It's funny until our family members are dying because of some of the choices that we make that are um, complicated with genetics and all the other reasons why diabetes is so rampant in our community, but a lot of it are things that we may be able to, to fight against. There are choices that we make that are a part of it, and we make light of it so much in our community. Everyone has diabetes, right? It's, it's something that we don't talk about and it's almost considered inevitable. Like, oh yeah, of course, you know, they got diabetes, they, everyone has it. 
And so in the film, we wanted to use comedy to almost make us you know, think about the fact that, well, it's not really funny, right? You're watching this person gorge himself. You're watching this person struggling with an addiction and struggling with something that's killing him. And so that's why we wanted to put that in there just to kind of play with both sides of your head. Like we, we like satire and we like kind of, we like that, but it's, it's a very dramatic piece, but we wanted to, to use that to really make people think. How does us having a social message inspire your creative as a whole? Well, you know, when we began our company, we really wanted to make films that will impact change or inspire someone to take an action. You know, we're, uh, it, it may be an action to, you know, just to, to, to laugh and have a better day, but with this particular project, it's an action that we want people to take up the mantle with us. Our goal for the film, you know, Brandon is personally committed to a lifestyle transformation for himself. And we wanted to put that into a, a script and on screen to take people along with us, to inspire other people to make those changes. So it's entitled 100 because Brandon's personally committed to losing 100 pounds to help change his life. And so that social impact, the, the ability to hopefully inspire other people who think, I can't do that, right? There's, there's no hope for me. I got what I got. It is what it is. And I'm just going to be this way. We're hoping that this film will help them say, well, if he did it, I can do it too. Which is absolutely incredible. Um, so what are some of your hopes with the project and where you hope that it'll end up next? Well, so we are in the development stage with this project. So this is what I would call a, a concept teaser or a proof of concept for the project. Um, and so we're now in development. We are working through pitching our project in order to raise funding to get the, the film to green light. And so there was a panel yesterday getting to green light. We are in that process of getting the project to green light to be able to get to production shortly and get this film made. Okay, I won't take up all of the questions because we are going to open it up to the audience afterwards. Um, but thank you so much for that. We really enjoyed it. Um, so Tasha, yeah. you want to talk about yours? So my project, like I said before, is a natural hair documentary, once again, where it talks about, you know, the brands, influencers, stylists, and clients. So this actually started um, with my actual natural hair journey. I was in transition, um, and I don't know if we have any natural releases in the house, which y'all kind of know. there. Like, yeah, so y'all kind of know what that's like, right? So we kind of be prolonging, like, the big chop process. Well, I had a, a great opportunity to meet uh, Michelle Breyer from Naturally Curly. So she invited us out to texture on the one way in New York. So yeah, I said, okay, well, you know, we'll be there. So I showed up at texture on the one way and I saw all of these beautiful black women wearing hair color, all kind of styles, big chops was on deck. And I was like, oh my God. I said, yes, when I get back, I'm cutting my hair off. Well, I cut my hair off but I didn't realize that I had 4C hair. <laughs> yeah, so y'all know about that, right? That 4C, I was like, uh-oh. I don't know necessarily what to do. I didn't know anything in reference to the texture. I didn't know anything about the products. I was just thinking in my head, hey, I'm more natural. I done been motivated and encouraged to cut my hair off. I'm good. So you thinking you got all that pretty hair? And that was a no. So I said, okay, let me see what's going on. We started reaching out to some of the brands only just because I wanted to find out like what was in the products. Um, so from there, it kind of just brought us into the you know influencers, how the brands actually work with the influencers to get their actual information out to the clients. And then we couldn't leave the stylists out only just because the stylists were getting upset about the influencers providing information in reference to taking care of natural hair. But then, we, the, you know, the clients were saying, well, we can't get the stylist to actually fix our hair. So this is a piece that kind of shows how all of that kind of worked together. Well, I have several questions, but let's show the content first. <laughs> Thank you. 
who make up this new natural hair movement.
So now styles like afros and braids and twists and cornrows and locks are protected. I asked you here today because we need to talk about something. New grooming policy. Due to recent inner office tensions, we have a new policy. And this is no curls, no kinks, and no lumps. I have the great fortune to work with women that appreciate and love natural hair and curly hair. And it's very professional. And there's no right way to wear it or style it. It's the hair on your head. I think on one level, it's outrage and anger. You know, this is who I am. Why can't I participate in the workforce this way? Or why is my child, you know, my kindergartner, why, aren't, why can't they go to school? Because they have locks. Baby. Did somebody do something to you? My teacher said that my hair was distracting and all the kids were laughing at me. Mom, can I get my hair straight, please? I don't want the other kids. Baby, we are not going to straighten your hair. There's nothing wrong with being a little different. Dear Miss Jess, could you please make sure Kayla's hair is combed and properly styled before coming to school? Her hair as it is, is a distraction to the class and other kids. Maybe a relaxer or other more traditional style would be better for everyone. I hope you understand and do the right thing. Miss Landers. <laughs> oh no. Listen, baby. You are beautiful just the way you are. There's nothing wrong with your hair or the way that it looks. It's not a distraction. You see mommy's hair? Some people don't like my hair either. But this is the way God intended it to be. Don't you let anybody tell you that your hair isn't beautiful just the way that it is. I'm going to talk to your teacher myself. Don't you worry about any of this. Mommy and Daddy love you very much. And God loves you too. Now, let's go get some ice cream. Okay? <laughs> Thank you, Mama. Me and make me feel better. I do like my hair. <laughs> We've been seeing what happens when people cannot express their natural beauty. And we're committed to people having a positive experience of beauty. And much too often, black women in particular are suppressed because of their hair. We have research that shows 80% of black women have to change their hair to feel that they're accepted in the workplace. So what this legislation does is incredible. It says you don't have to. You can bring your natural self to work. You can bring your natural self to school. And that means you can bring your best self and one day be Senator Holly Mitchell or more. Tasha, that was so great. Um, what I found really, really fascinating was the fact that you kept narrative vignettes within your story, but then you also had interviews also. So, so how did you go about shooting that, or how did you plan for it? Was that part of your original intention? 
So no, not at first. Um, the one thing we wanted to do was make sure that we were able to capture attention. Um, sometimes when you have documentaries, you know, you really can't kind of bring the audience in as much as we would like. So really ours is really kind of like docutainment. So um, we actually kind of started writing some segments so that way we can kind of um, do some, you know, reenactments so people can kind of really understand um, even though you are a naturalista, you can kind of take, you know, possession of your own beauty, but you still sometimes get, you know, a little bit, you know, resistance and rejection sometimes. Docutainment, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when you were shooting this or when you were collecting research, did you go to a lot of hair conventions or did you get to go to any curly shows? Or? I, I did. And like I said, I did um, uh, naturally curly, um, but uh, we did a lot of research. I, I showed up, you know, at, at a lot of places. I always made sure, you know, if there was a her show or some kind of convention or something going on. Um, we've been, you know, working on the project for about two years, so we've been traveling the country just kind of, you know, gathering data, of course, and being able to kind of interview, you know, with the brands uh, and stylists and clients, um, you know, of course, if they were willing to. Uh, we Everyone was, you know, real receptive. So we just kind of just hunkered down. Um, a lot of the things that you see are experiences that people have had and my personal experiences as well. I even had like, you know, one of my family members actually called me nappy at one point. Um, also, you know, I, you know, I visit a doctor's office. I had a lady that would not stop staring at me. So, you know, I was asking her, you know, was she okay? And she would not even speak. She just kind of kept looking at me and I was like, oh, okay, it's the brown afro, so. Um, just kind of, you know, that. Um, a lot of times it's really, um, when you're getting that, it's not necessarily someone who's not black. Normally you get the rejection from someone who is black, and I found that kind of mind-blowing. So that's why documenting this was like so, so important, um, just because, you know, we have come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. And I wanted to kind of capture both of those perspectives. It'd be your own people. <laughs> but um, you also mentioned uh, different hair textures, too, mm -hmm. beforehand. You were talking about um, how 4C textures don't get as much depiction. Right. How did you how did you see more into that when you were doing research for this? Did you see that come up a lot, even with hair shows? So it was kind of like both. So you'll get um, people that will sometimes say, hey, texture doesn't matter. And then you'll get some that say texture does matter. Um, I think um, in the natural hair community, sometimes we have identified one texture of hair as being more than the next, but now there's traction in saying, hey, you know, 4C is, you know, just as good as, you know, someone that's 3A or 3B. Um, I think from being a naturalist and having the, the most tighter curls um, or coils, um, you have to kind of just take ownership of your own beauty and not try to compare your hair to someone else. So I, that's probably one of the bigger things. Or the myth that it doesn't grow. That right, whole thing. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, so when you were talking about products and mm -hmm. the conspiracy around that or different secrets that were on the label that we weren't realizing, right. what all did you discover with that? So, um, you know, with the products, uh, the one thing I think we had to kind of go back and uh, do from just, you know, gathering the information and interviewing that um, naturalists have to learn kind of like the porosity levels and understanding how to apply the product and understanding that not all of the same products, you know, would work for Sakita that would actually work for me um, and so on, that you would really have to, I hate to say it, find yourself being a product junkie. You have to almost like, buy something to kind of find out if it actually works. But once you kind of understand the porosity level, uh, once you kind of understand the texture of, you know, your hair, then that can kind of help you uh, more with the process. So as I was kind of gathering all the data and interviewing, that's one of the things, uh, you know, that we got in reference to the clients that uh, you have to kind of understand the whole circle of it. Okay, great. Again, I won't take up all the audience questions, but thank you for that. Tia, would you like to introduce yours? Absolutely. So, Gentrified Again is a web series that um, I sat down and I created because I wanted to kind of paint a picture about um, people of color that are being displaced, black and brown people. Um, the story is set here in Austin, um, and if you're from Austin and you live here, you know that there's been some serious changes. And I do believe that the current percentage of um, black Austin, I think it's like 7%, um, and it's decreasing every day. I've come across so many amazing women who I connect with, and then they're like, hey girl, I'm moving. And I'm like, but wait, what, how long? It's only about 10 of us, where are you going? Um, <laughs> and you know, it's, it's a lot to do with um, 
to, to kind of carry that weight of not being able to kind of see yourself in the city, not being represented in the city, not having places to go somewhere as simple as, hey, I want to have a drink. I want to walk into a bar and be able to feel comfortable. Um, so I kind of wanted to paint the picture and see what kind of show people what kind of emotional impact um, an individual may go through. So what you guys are watching today is at the actual trailer for the series. Um, and it has three characters. Greta, the main character, loses her grandmother. Her grandmother leaves her the house on the east side of Austin. And she's trying to figure out how to keep this house. She doesn't have the finances. She's going through depression, all these emotional kind of struggles. And we kind of follow that story. Um, and it also, again, two different characters. Um, Dania, her best friend, who is there by her side. Um, she's a part of the LGBT community. And because of how she identifies, her mother puts her out of her house. So she ends up living with her best friend, Coretta. And of course, she can't afford to move out on her own because the cost of living in Austin is so extremely high um, that living on your own right now is almost kind of impossible unless you're making a good amount of money out here. Um, and then along with her, it's her brother, Aaron, who kind of sees gentrification from a different lens, a different view. The way he looks at it is, hey, if I can make it out, everybody can make it out. So I kind of wanted to slice it from three different vantage points and to, to kind of tell that story that way. So again, what you guys will see is the trailer. Um, and we are kind of close to finishing post-production, so the series will be out soon. I'm excited to announce the, the date. I'm excited too. Let's see it. I know this house is literally the only thing I have left. That's my business. This looks amazing. <laughs> I got chills, y'all. Seeing it on like a screen that big, like almost made me cry, like legit. So, yeah. Was this the first screening? Um, seeing it this way in public, yes, it's been on like our YouTube channel, um, but seeing it on this really huge screen kind of did something for me. So yeah, I'm fired up right now. <laughs> We're fired up too. So with you being from Austin especially, why was this story so important to tell and what do you hope that people take away from it? Honestly, I think that being a black woman in America, period, um, you go through, honestly, not feeling like you're being represented in the best way. It's hard to kind of see yourself a lot. And gentrification to me kind of adds to that, but in your own neighborhood. Um, the gentleman who allowed us to film in his home, we were standing outside, and he has a generational home. His grandparents, their people, and their people. And next to it is this house that rings for, I think, like $700 a night on Airbnb and they were about to have to sell their home. 
And he told me, he was like, you know what, even if I could keep it, I don't know if I would want to because I don't feel like I belong here anymore. And so the reason that I wanted to tell the story is for people like him. It's like, okay, everybody again is looking at the politics, but there are everyday people who are being impacted by this and who's taking care of them. There has to be something that we can do. And that's kind of what I hope people take away from it. Look at us as people and then maybe we can start having real conversations about how we can impact change and what can be done to take care of the people who have been here, especially for Austin. Um, those of you who are from Austin, you know that back in the day, segregation occurred and you actually, if you were black or brown, you had to move to the east side of Austin, you were required to live there. And now those very people are being pushed out after they brought so much culture to that side because of money. And I need people to think about that. Wow, um, and, and like you said, it is something that affects so many places in different ways, but that does seem to be the root of the evil and all the different situations. So it's it's amazing that you chose a location that also reflected that, and then it's also presented in the narrative. So in, in filming in Austin, what were some of your favorite experiences on set and some of the pros in getting to shoot at home? Um, honestly, it was an amazing experience. It was stressful. If you're a filmmaker, then you know, like, oh my gosh. Creating, like trying to find the fun to me was probably the hardest part about this experience. But once we got on set, being with my cast and my crew, it was like a family. And I think that's something that I will literally like here with me forever. Um, so I'd say that was probably the most positive thing. Um, the hardest part again, I think, will just be funding, um, trying to figure out how you're gonna make it happen. As a filmmaker, you have all these ideas and things that you wanna you know, see come to life, but if you don't have the funds behind it, you kinda can't do anything. Um, so I'd say that that was probably the hardest part. And where can we go to follow, follow the series, or are you doing any crowdfunding? How can we support? Absolutely. So gingerfiedseries.com is our website. We do have a GoFundMe to currently um, help with post-production costs. Um, you can also follow us on all social media at Gentrified Series on Facebook, on Twitter, um, on Instagram, and we will be announcing the premiere date pretty soon. Um, and we're still talking about distribution and where our final home is going to be, so, yeah. Looking forward to it. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay, Manira, Hi. your turn. I'd love to hear about your project. All right, so this is called Catches Calling F4 Defense 101. And Great name. <laughs> it is, um, you know, as a black woman, life can just be largely absurd. And there is nothing more absurd than dating. So this is this one was really a call to action for ladies around the world um, who might be considering compromising self-respect and sanity, and just peace of mind in your body, um, for someone who might not be the best person for you. So would you just roll the room with them? Hit it. <laughs> I invite you all into your feelings. When you were quick to get fucked up. My name is Ketchum Williams, <laughs> and I save lives. What if you're in love? Fuck love! See, that's the problem. Everybody want to be a boss until it's time to control your own emotions. So how can we avoid them? Die! <laughs> <laughs> Don't be alive! See, look, ladies, let me, let, let me learn y'all something here today. It don't matter your race, your social economic background, your political affiliation, your gross and net income, your religion, uh, how many pets you own, how many kids you got, uh, your employment status, your STD status. As long as you are breathing, you will attract fuckboys. And they are all knowing. And they are all seen. And they are thirsty. And baby girl, you're the nectar. Mm -hmm. See, now the only thing you can do is to try to protect yourself the best way you know how. But that's why you're here today, lady. Now let's get this one. Now I survived three fuckboys in the winter of 2003. And then again the following spring. Now there's a reason for that. God placed me in those situations. And he placed Dantavius. Trontavis and Richard in my life so that I can share my testimony and help other women through my ministry. And there's a calling on my life. And I'm here to ask you. I'm here because a man took my coffee, he was going to the store to get some cigarettes, but he'd been gone for four days. <laughs> now, 
<laughs> Can someone tell me what a fuck boy looks like? Okay, you. A beautiful thick beard and excuses. Okay, good, good, good. What else? He has an android with a crack screen. <laughs> Sometimes. But that's good. That's good. The most important thing in defending yourself against a fuckboy is to be steadfast in your action. Now, ladies, I want you all to repeat after me. Do not respond to minimum efforts. Do not respond to minimum efforts. Do not lower your standards. Do not lower your standards. Be honest about your expectations. Be honest about your because if the dick is gone, oh bitch, it's a wrap. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I don't even like dudes, but this one time got my ass on this part. Now, ladies, this first technique is called cut the bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Cut the bullshit out. It has to stop somewhere. Now, I know some of you ladies get texts at night. You up? Hell no, I'm sweet. Cut the bullshit. You ain't getting none tonight. Or WYD. What, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We 20, 30, 40 years old. I need four words, complete sentences. What are you doing? <laughs> Cut the bullshit. <laughs> that it's me. Um, I think most comedians, I don't consider myself to be a comedian, but I do, I am a comedic writer. But they will say, like, it's born out of trauma, so I had a fair amount of that <laughs> growing up, so it was a, a defense mechanism for me. But for this um, film in particular, it's just uh, a manifestation of all of the conversations that I've had over brunch or ladies' nights or where I was just saying the same stuff over and over and over and I was like, I just need to make, it would be wonderful if there was like some kind of self-defense class for women so that they could get it into, them into their heads 
create some kind of uh, creed or something, something they could watch to remind them that this behavior is not okay and you need to defend yourself against it. And you know, F boys, it's, it's the term for today, but the characteristics and the behaviors have been around forever. Our aunties, head of my grandmas dealt with them. They were called maybe womanizers or rolling stones or whatever. But you know, the terminology and the technology has changed, but this kind of stuff has been around for a long time. So I'm just, I'm a advocate for, um, <laughs> I'm an advocate, I'm an activist against a fuckboy wizardry. Okay. <laughs> Say that. Um, so, is this going to be an ongoing series with different situations, or? Well, yeah. This is a part of my whole John Land's uh, experience. I, I started off with the cartoon that went viral last year, but then people, I think people thought that that's all I did was cartoon. So I had to switch it up on them, and this was one of the first ones that I did under the, the whole John Land uh, umbrella, but. No, I do, I do cartoons, I do the live action, I just do whatever, you know, comes to me, so. What was the relationship with the cast? How were they selected? Because they were, they were excellent. <laughs> I know all of those ladies personally. Um, they're not all actors. Some of them are, some of them are seniors. Uh, Bianca is a fabulous actress. Uh, she does comedy, drama. She was catchy, the, the instructor. Um, but they're mostly women that I know in real life, that some of them are dealing with fuck boys as we speak right now. I hope you're watching. This is a reminder to don't stray from the path, ladies. Um, and then some of them were just women who wanted to be a part of whatever I was doing. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a good mixture. Of Authenticity. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you for that. Jabri, welcome. I'd love to hear your introduction and, and to hear about your project as well. Yeah, so um, my name is Jabri Weber. I too am an advocate for women's <laughs> rights. Um, love, love that. Um, my project is called It Happened One Night. It's a drama set in the near future, 2022. And it's about the abortion ban. And our protagonist, Tia, uh, she struggles to find the care that she needs after a scheduled procedure. And I don't want to spoil too much, but um, we could definitely dive into it after we want. Perfect. Let's see. How long have you been up? A couple hours. Well, I figured you might get hungry later, so I got snacks. I just had dinner. Thanks, though. <laughs> Go on, babe. Just how you like it. So, did you take the medicine while I was gone? What? I think the doctor said you can take one every six hours. Oh, right. They talk to me once every night. Sixteen. What? The news reported that sixteen women were found dead today. Not Under any other circumstance, I would have been seventeen. But you're not 17. All right, we've been through this over and over again. These people got money. T 
See, they got money and power. So what? I just play nice, and then I too can benefit from such an illustrious life? Don't assume. We have no idea what these girls did. All right, they might have got themselves caught up in some mess they shouldn't have been in. And what, they deserve to die? That's not what I'm saying. Then what are you saying? I'm saying that we're lucky. Your procedure went up without a hitch. That's all we can worry about. Don't. Just relax. I got it. I need you to relax, too. So any mention of the pregnancy? No. Or my name. Well, I'm glad. <sighs> Philip came by the visit today. this it's a check for a million dollars I know it's a settlement he doesn't want to go to court civil or otherwise okay well I'll call the lawyers in the morning wow my god T this is a lot of money do a lot with that kind of money. Run away, start over. Put this scandal behind us. Us? Yeah, us. We're in this together. What if I wanted to keep the baby? Well, then I would have been there for you and I would support you 100%. You'd still want to marry me? I think you already know the answer to that question. That's good to know. All these recent movements about women's rights, uh, there was like this eruption, uh, and there was tons of support, but there weren't a lot of women of color at the forefront of it, um, you know, whose stories were being supported, who were being rooted for it. But then I would turn to my same community and see so many women struggling with those same things, um, and I wanted to uh, make a piece that was the perfect intersection of the two, two things that I feel like are really um, timely in this current climate and women right now um, are dealing with these things and our voices are, especially women of color, our voices are, are not necessarily at the forefront of these movements and I wanted to just show what that looks like. It's the, the, on top of everything that you just said also, there's been conversation about the idea of the man's responsibility in, in their ability to stay or leave if the woman then has that choice, which is an ongoing conversation that they haven't quite figured out yet, but even ideas of like having a prenup for the baby before the baby comes, all kinds of um, ideas that they've thrown out there. So why did you choose to leave that ambiguous about whether he'd return or not? Um, 
You know, I this film is to, to plant seeds into people's minds. Um, I'm not trying to get you to be for or against abortion, pro-choice. This isn't even about that. What I want to incite is for people to be more cognizant of how they're treating women um, and being more compassionate for a woman in that situation. It's not even asking you to take a stance either way. It's just, if a woman does want to choose, can we support her in doing that? Uh, do we have to make it difficult for her in that you know she doesn't have safe and healthy options to even have a procedure or there are no uh, healthy outlets for her, even if you know you personally are against it. And so that was left ambiguous for a reason because uh, you know these kinds of things that are happening in people's day to days are kind of muddy in this way. There is no clear and right path that someone should do if in the situation. It's not so clean cut in that way. Um, but the, the real thought is, is about that compassion for women who could be in that situation in a place where there isn't access to it. And with it being such a heavy message, when you're dealing with something like that and you have talent on set, how is it directing something like that and making sure that they were in both the correct mind space for the character but also handling it well for themselves? Absolutely. Um, so I'm an actor myself, and so my approach is always, I'm an actor's director. Um, so it's always story first, character first, and then the technical components are then after that. So before we even got on set, we had rehearsals and, you know, we talked about it. We talked about abortion, we talked about these characters in their background, how happy they were before this incident, and, you know, even what the future would look like having you know, this, this money that's supposed to fix their problems. And so we got in the weeds of all of that. So by the time we got on set, you know, they were comfortable and they felt safe to really play. And in that last scene, um, you know, we, we improvised a lot. You know, there were times when, before we got just to what the script was, I was like, let's just riff, let's just improv and see, you know, We'll step away from the script and let's just go off of what you're feeling, you know, even if it's completely off, we'll go back. Um, and I think that just allowed for a really safe um, and, and fun experience on set. Well, I have a couple questions for all of you and then we can open it up to the audience. So, of course, you, you all directed your own pieces. And this wasn't your first time, was it, Tasha? That's incredible. That's that's incredible. <laughs> that was a huge undertaking as well for all of you, um, especially you, since this was your first project. What would some of the what were some of the great challenges that you encountered, and what what did you learn from them? Um, so for me, since this is my first piece, I actually have a partner. So the great thing about having a, a you know a technical partner, he's um, really good in actually teaching me and showing me. Um, we kind of got I kind of got a little frustrated with him sometimes. Um, <laughs> I know, right? Um, but he's he was really good about making sure you know that I, I learned. So I kind of had to pull back and kind of check myself to be able to say, hey, if you want to you know be able to kind of learn this, you're gonna really have to kind of you know take it down a little bit. Um, realize that he's trying to help you and he's trying to feed you information. So you need to kind of you know take it in and not only that, ask more questions. I think sometimes as a woman. Um, we kind of have a tendency to not want to ask for help because we're so used to kind of like directing and running families and doing all of this that when we need help, sometimes we don't really necessarily want to ask for it. Um, so I come to realize I really have to ask, you know, a lot more questions and, and be open and trust my creative mindset. Anyone else want to speak on that? Well, I've been um, filmmaking for 15 or 16 years, but I went viral last year with the cartoon that I, that I did, and that brought a lot of attention from, I mean, I checked my inbox and people from Netflix and Harlow and, and BET and, and all these major production companies were trying to figure out who I was and what I was about and all of that, and so that brought a pressure. It brought um, expectations. I feel like that is the mother right there because there's expectations that I have for what I want to do and what I want to pr produce and present and create. And then I think there's expectations for what others have of me. And so it's like trying to find a comfortable middle ground there 
where I'm giving you what you want, but I'm also not giving you anything that I don't want you to have. And it's not a bastardized version of something that I, you know, created from inception. Um, so that has been a challenging part of this whole black woman rising <laughs> process, <laughs> journey. Um, for me, I would say that I would, I was in my own way. I almost didn't make this piece because um, I had so many fears, I guess, is what it really is when you boil it down. You know, like, oh, you know, it could be better, or I should make it longer, or I don't have enough money, or uh, I wish, you know, I could get more support and more people, or what if I had someone to produce it? And so all these things, even though I was literally ready to go, and it, it got to a point where I was like, I should just make it. Um, and if I don't like it, I'll put it on the shelf with my other hundred batch of films. But if not, you know, I actually conquered uh, a fear. Yeah, I have to agree with, with both. Um, for me, I think because of the, the topic or the subject of gentrification, a lot of people have kind of come out and supported and given, you know, given all this feedback, so it's brought that attention to the project, which is good, because of course you want attention, that's what you, you know, you're putting it out there for that reason. But like she was saying, it also for me, it was that self-doubt, that, that fear of failure, like, okay, people are actually looking at this, like what if it's not what they expect it to be? What if I fall flat on my face with it? People hate it, you know what I mean? So it's that fear of letting people down. Um, but I also had to kind of get to a point and say, hey, this is my art, I'm gonna put it out, this is what it's gonna be, and hopefully y'all enjoy it. I love it if you don't, sorry. Um, but yeah, so that's been something to kind of get over. For us, I think the biggest challenge was that it's such a personal topic. I mean, we're putting ourselves on display, we're showing, you know, a very personal, we're showing our weight, right? We're, we're putting my husband on, on, on film. And so in doing this project and in the promise that we've made to ourselves, that is also the promise that we're making to the film of losing 100 pounds, it's never been done before to put someone on the spot to do something like that in the course of a film. And so what we're doing is, you know, could be groundbreaking and that's a lot of pressure on us and that's a lot of, um, Fear and some, sometimes we're like, okay, what are we doing on set? Today we're gonna get naked on set, right? That's that's a big deal, right? And so that's that's the biggest challenge, I think, for us as we go into the project. Okay, um, so we're gonna get ready to open it up to the audience. Um, I'll ask one more that'll kind of lead to what may, they may also wanna know too. But on the topic of Black Women Rising, was any of this exacerbated in terms of the challenges by being women of color, or were there any benefits to your creative lens by being women of color? For me, I don't, I don't think there are any challenges of the project by being a woman of color. I think the challenges are now are um, getting that project to the next level to get it out to the world. And that's um, a mixture of being a woman of color. It's a mixture of geography. It's a mixture of networking. So all those things that, that have to come together in order to, to elevate a project are what uh, we're dealing with now, those challenges. And for me, I actually kind of, you know, agree with um, kind of Sakita. I really didn't necessarily, as far as the challenges, um, wasn't really necessarily bad. A lot of people were actually receptive um, to it. So it really kind of wasn't, you know, hard to be able to kind of look at it, you know, from that. Um, right now, uh, I think the thing is to kind of be able to, you know, finish the project and then find it exactly strategically what needs to happen next once it is finished. Like she said, being able to... Uh, put it out, but not only that, how do we want to go about doing that? Um, and and kind of, you know, just in reference to, you know, her part, being able to kind of, uh, you know, own what we're actually doing, so that way we can kind of give a little bit where we don't feel like somebody's actually going to take over and not do creatively what we actually set out for it to be. I think for me, um, there was also a benefit. I think that we're at a point now where people are actually looking to see more black women in front of them. You have Issa Rae, you have Ava, and a lot of people are kind of hungry for uh, black female filmmakers. So for me, for where I am at this very moment, I look at it more as it being beneficial. People kind of seek you out for that. You know, I've gotten messages from even younger girls who are like, hey, can you be a mentor? And I'm like, well, I'm not at the part, I'm not, I'm not there yet. But when I get there, sure. Um, but yeah, so for me, I think it's been more so beneficial than a challenge, if anything. Um, what the part that I would say has been challenging is that we have a lot of secrets in the black community. And so talking about 
these kinds of things, you know, I have heard some people be like, oh no, that, that couldn't happen. But then it's like, oh, let me pull this article from CNN. It did happen yesterday. Um, but on the flip side, the beautiful thing is that it's also made other women of color be really comfortable. I had a young girl, an international student, uh, come up to me, she was Asian. And she said nothing, but she was just like hugging me and, you know, teary eyed. And in those ways, it's like, you know, by putting a black woman at the forefront, it also made other women feel comfortable enough to, to share this experience. Yeah, um, I think we're, we're finally at a point where the industry is starting to recognize or acknowledge that uh, black people, not just black women, but just black people are starting to see themselves in a myriad of ways. Like you want to be uh, the superheroes, black people. We want the girls trips, movies, we want the coming of age, we want all of the things. And um, I think when I did this cartoon, it, it, it made people aware that we want to see ourselves in that medium too. Because we haven't had anything for, since I guess the Boondocks, but that's coming back. We have a whole wave of animated stuff coming back right now, which is really exciting. So, no, I think the, I think the playing field is wide open and it's ours and Thank you for that. We're going to open up for questions now. Does anyone have anything they'd like to ask our lovely panelists? I knew she was going to ask a question. <laughs> okay, I just want to apologize to anyone that was here yesterday for my question. <laughs> Okay, um, so I wanted to ask about the bastardizing, um, and particularly for you all having all of these personal stories. When you're going to get greenlit, I know there is some kind of moral um, battle inside when you know you may be sitting next to it in front of an exec who doesn't really understand your story and wants to commercialize it and market it. So going up into those things and you being ready for like a feature, how, does that, how, would, how do you feel as though you would combat that when you have that meeting? I think for I th I think a lot of what these ladies were saying about the industry wanting the unique point of view, and so I believe that once you get to that point, that's what they want. They want you to come in and do something that's different, and so to whitewash it or or water it down in any way is going to make it not as successful. It, it's not the niche is what's making it successful, and so I, I think for any of these projects, that's probably what's going to make them stand out and, and be better. And so I think if you're in the room, that's why you're in the room, is that they want to do something different. Yeah, and it's just you have to be your own advocate. Like, you have to say, hey, you, I'm here for a reason. Like, trust, trust me. <laughs> trust black women. Um, and just let me do what I do. And I think we are seeing a lot of shows like Atlanta on FX where they just kind of give the, the, the creatives the, the reins. And they just go off and they make stuff. And... People like it, so I think the more we do that, we let people just do what they do, then you know the more we'll get it and be received. Yeah, and I think to kind of just add on to that, I think um, kind of you know once we get into room into the room. Like I was saying, you really have to kind of be someone to kind of like stand your ground. It's almost like sh what Sherry was saying on yesterday. You have to be somebody to decide on if this is something that, you know, you want to do, even though you have that opportunity. If they are not kind of painting it in a way that you really want it to be presented, are you going to say, you know, yes, and kind of minimize really how you feel about it versus saying, uh, no, that's okay. Let me see if I can find someone else. Anyone else questions? Okay. All right. Thank you so much for sharing your black girl magic with us, ladies. I really enjoyed having this conversation.